The revolution yep. will not be televised. It will be individualized. You're tuning in to another episode of The Revolution. We'll be live streamed with TK and my brother, Kamal. Kamal, how's it going, my brother? What's up? What's up? I'm ready for this episode, <laughs> man. We're going to bring a little... Uh, what's, the, what's the term I'm looking for? I want to say sarcasm, but there's another term in the literary world for when you write with a sense of irony. I'll, I'll think of it later. I'm sure you'll tell me in the comments. But today we're going to talk about simple rules for making all your dreams untrue. Making all your dreams untrue. I think sometimes it's good to go about things in an indirect way, to take self-defeating ways of thinking and spell them out so explicitly that when you look at them, you go, oh my gosh, that's the idea? That's the assumption that's defeating me? And that's kind of what I set out to do when I wrote an article called 10 Rules for Making All Your Dreams Untrue. And we're going to take a few of the points from that article and we're gonna riff on them together. So what we'll do is we have three points. We'll show on the screen one of those points at a time, and then I'll read a little bit of context from the article, and then we'll converse about it like we usually do. So let's waste no time and let's dive right in with point number one. Delay all creativity until you're, ri until you're rich. Number one, delay all creativity until you're rich. I know I'm not the first person to say this, but it bears repeating. It takes money to make money. It takes money to make money. Write that down and treat it like a Bible verse. If you don't believe in the Bible, treat it like a scientific rule. Don't question it. Don't look for evidence to the contrary. Just accept it and deal with it. If you're not already swimming in a sea of cash, I want you to do the following exercise every morning. Get out of bed, look in the mirror and say, I'm broke as a joke. Then laugh at all the foolish people who sincerely think they're capable of making any impact without having lots of money first. Pat yourself on the back and thank the gods or the scientific community for having given you the wisdom to avoid such silliness. Once you've broken free from the herd mentality of all the little sheeple who believe that creativity is more important than money, take a break from your dreams until you have enough money in your bank account to answer every tough question that can be asked about your future survival. Trust me on this one. Better yet, don't trust me. Take a look at every successful artist, innovator, or entrepreneur. Every single one of them had all of their financial ducks in a row before they started performing, creating, and building. And please don't listen to people who bring up J.K. Rowling. How many bestsellers have those people published? Before you answer that question, finish point number six. All right. There you go. That's rule number one. Wait until you got the money first. Don't waste your time trying to create without any money. People that are tuning in in the middle are like, what? What is this brother talking about? You know, it's this is this is kind of interesting because it's a parody. Like we're 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 joking in in what we're telling you. Like obviously this is not what we really believe. We actually believe the exact opposite. So I'm just gonna go ahead and speak to that. But by the this way, is it, actually, is, it is an accurate rule for making your dreams untrue. Sure. Making your dreams untrue. I mean, if that's in the business that you're in, we're not in that business. Uh, so, you know, all the power to you. Um, you probably would. It wouldn't even make sense for you to watch the show anyway, if you're in the business of making your dreams untrue. But nonetheless, that's what the title is. So I'll stay the course. Um, I was actually having a conversation this weekend about taking leaps and fear and the things that paralyze you from, from making progress and for going for your dreams or for, or, or for going, especially with what your intuition tells you to do, because there's been a lot of times in my life where my intuition is telling me to go for something. Uh, but when I think about it in my head, it is not logical. It doesn't make sense. I can't, see step one, step two, step three. So I, it, it's not all laid out for me. And I think being somebody who likes to think in it and move in a calculated fashion, I, I want those answers. Um, I, I want the certainty. I, I want the clarity for the path that I'm about to walk. And to me, that's what this point really speaks to. It speaks to the challenge of walking by faith you know, not not knowing 
that you're going to get rich from your creativity, uh, not knowing that the things that you're going to do are going to lead to success. Um, and I think the temptation for a lot of creators, a lot of entrepreneurs, um, and then people who want to make things is to view their creativity or their passion to make things as something they'll do once they're already comfortable or to view it as a passion project that actually can't help them uh, build and sustain the life that they want. And, and I think it's, it, <laughs> it's one of those things where uh, it, it takes, I think, a leap of courage um, to some degree that you, you just have to go for it. Uh, but I think prior to that, like it's important to give yourself permission to not have it all figured out. You know, you, you don't need to be a millionaire for you to record your first independent movie. Um, you know, that the, the being even having a lot of money does not necessarily position you to be competitive in the creative marketplace. Just because somebody has a lot of resources doesn't mean their business is necessarily going to succeed. It might seem that on the onset, they have an advantage. Um, but there's advantages in all kinds of different aspects when it comes to business, when it comes to creativity. And I think don't discount uh, your advantage of passion, of vision, of intuition, because you don't have a certain amount of resources or you don't have a certain amount of money. Sometimes, um, you, I think not sometimes, but almost all the time that you don't need to f have it all figured out. You don't need all the money in the world uh, to, to go after the things that really make you come alive. Um, and, and just to give your permission, give yourself permission to, to just move forward without having it all figured out. I love that, man. I grew up in a space where people talked a lot about excellence and you would hear people say things like, if I'm going to put my name on something, it's got to be top quality. And it sounds noble on the surface and it expresses an attitude that I do think is important in, in a sense, which is making sure that you take pride in your work. But excellence can very easily become an excuse for failing to execute. And my advice for anyone that's passionate about excellence is exactly that. Don't let your desire for excellence become an excuse to avoid execution. The best way to get to excellence is to start where you are right now and say, how can I get better from here? And then how can I get better from there? And the more you aim at better, the closer you'll get to good. And if you keep aiming at better, you'll eventually arise at excellence. Arrive, you'll eventually arrive at excellence, not as some static final stage of life, but rather as this dynamic ongoing process that you are now participating in as a result of being committed to getting better all the time. And so the money, the money issue is a really good example of how we use our desire for excellence to hold ourselves back. It's easy to think, well, it takes money to make money. Well, no, it doesn't. It takes value creation to make money. There are lots of people who have gone from having little to no money that have created great wealth because they figured out a way to take their talents and their resources and their abilities to solve problems for other people, to make a positive difference in other people's lives. And they were able to get some money. And then by focusing on better, they were able to get more and they continue to build on that. But in order to get past that money hurdle, you have to give yourself the permission to grow incrementally. So you use the example of an independent film. You don't have to be a millionaire to make your independent film. That's, ex ex that's absolutely true. But you have to give yourself permission to grow incrementally. If you say, well, for me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to make this film unless it looks like you know something that's got a $20 million budget. Well, that film's probably never going to get done because the people that might be willing to put that kind of money in it will never see a prototype. They'll never see anything that gets them excited enough to invest in. And so you've got to be able to build some momentum. And that means saying, all right, I only have $100 right now. I only have $25 right now. I'm going to do the best I can to make this film with my iPhone. 
and just just do something that kind of conveys the essence of a story. And even though that's going to be beneath my ideal expectations, I at least have something that I can show to other people that allows them to get excited about what it could be. Because, because people can always imagine, especially people with money, they can always imagine how much better yeah. something can be if they add bells and whistles to it. But if you never do anything at all, if you never get it off the ground because you're waiting for the bells and whistles first, you're never going to get started. I would also say that it the, that process of incremental growth helps you as well. I think if mm -hmm. you were uh, to get handed a $20 million budget and you've never shot a movie before, you've never had some projects that failed previously, you've never gone through that creative process, I think you're setting yourself up for failure. It's important to get those mm -hmm. reps in. And you don't even have, like if, if you're gonna approach um, doing something creating something, you know, coming up with something and bringing it to the marketplace. If you're going to approach that process, you don't necessarily have to think about it. Um, like, I don't have all the assets I need. So uh, I'm already thinking that I'm, I'm not going to be able to compete properly. But if you approach it with the mindset of like, I'm doing this for the sake of learning, I'm doing this for the sake of my own self-improvement and you have mm -hmm. more of a selfish mindset into going into it. I, th I think you take some of the pressure off of yourself because you're not necessarily concerned with consumers in the marketplace and how people uh, receive it, but you're more concerned with how can I make it the best that I possibly can make it based off of the existing knowledge that I have today. And going about creating that way, I think sets yourself up to not only create better projects in the future, but to also make you a better creator. It, it sets you up uh, to grow, to learn. Um, and and it goes back to that old adage that, you know, it's learning by fire. Like the, the that's one of the quickest ways to learn is, is just to, to go for it, just to immerse yourself. Um, yeah. and, and you'll learn so much more building a business um, than you will reading about it, you know, like, just sometimes yeah. you just got to go for it. And those lessons will help prepare you for when you do get the right resources, when you do get the right opportunity. Um, and then, you know, you're in a position where you can knock it out the park. Yeah, man, that's a really good point. And I don't know if that gets talked about enough, how money can not only give you a lot of options for how you can do good in the world and how you can express yourself creatively, but it also gives you more options for how you can destroy yourself. The mistakes you make with 20 million are very different from the mistakes you make with $20, right? You make a mistake with $20 that you have a pretty limited capacity for how much damage you can do. You make a bad move with 20 million, you're hurting a lot of people and yourself. And the things that we have to do to get to that level where we have access to and control of large amounts of resources are usually the things that build the character and the competence so that by getting there, we not only have what we need, but we can handle what we need. And being able to handle it is just as important as being able to have it. Let's go to number two. Well, I was just gonna add oh, yeah, yeah. one, one last thing to that. Um, Patrice Washington, the money maven, she actually came on the podcast uh, when when you were yeah. recording um, during the first season, and and she was one of the guests, and and she talked about um, just just financial literacy, you know, having a money mindset, um, and and setting yourself up for success, and when it comes to that game, and one of the things that she talked about that really stood out to me is that the same kinds of people who have, uh, you know. $2,000 budgets uh, are going to make the same kinds of decisions when their budgets are 20,000 or 200,000. Like you learn your values now. You know, if, if you're somebody who b goes out and blows your whole check uh, within the first three days of getting paid, uh, those are habits. Those are fundamental habits that you should assess before uh, trying to make more money because all more money is going to do is magnify those habits, magnify those problems. And I think mm. the same is true with the illustration that you just brought up about having a bigger budget for, you know, a creative endeavor. If, if you, 
if you don't, if you've never been in that position, if, if you're not even good with managing the little money that you got, what makes you think that, you, that you're going to be better when you have a huge budget to manage? Like there's going to be so much more pressure and so much more um, room for error. And when you get these smaller opportunities, like don't disregard them based out of disappointment or based out of, you know, your own expectations because you wanted something better, like embrace the opportunity, understand that, you know, it's a part of the learning process and uh, just, just take it as an opportunity. Don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself be, to just go for the next biggest thing. Um, because a lot of times, if you haven't gone through these baby steps, you're not ready for the next biggest thing anyway. Mm. Mm. I, I I need the lighter, man. I need the lighter. <laughs> Let's go to number two. <laughs> Make sure you feel worthy before engaging in new activities. That's my second rule for making all your dreams come untrue. Make sure you feel worthy. Little context. Whenever you feel inspired to act on a creative idea, refuse to take a single step forward until you can come up with an airtight, logical argument proving that you deserve to do what you're interested in doing. Don't treat your self-esteem as if it's something that can be gradually developed through creative risk taking. Instead, sit on your butt and refuse to move until you feel totally impressed with the fact of your own existence. It may take a while, but if you ever get there, you'll really be impressed with yourself. If you learn nothing else, learn this. Getting stuff done isn't the goal. Creating actual results isn't what being creative is all about. The goal is to spend your creative energy trying to convince yourself that the gods or the scientific community have deemed you worthy of all you desire. Don't ever lift a finger if you're even slightly unsure about that. Insecurity equals the little angel on your shoulder telling you to sit down and shut up. Listen to it. Man, that one right there was something I wrote in response to seeing so many people say, I want to do this. I want to try this, but I'm not sure if I have the right to. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, what do you mean? You're not sure if you have the right to. Certainly what you desire to do isn't illegal. So what do you mean? Well, I'm not sure if I'm worthy to call myself this or that. And there's some kind of fear that if they embark on a particular journey, if they try their hand at some some craft, there will be people that'll say, oh, what are you doing? You're not a real uh, whatever. You know, maybe somebody who's worked in business all their life decides they want to take an improvisational class and they're like super scared that their theater friends are going to be like, what are you doing? You're not worthy to do that. You're a business person. And so we have all of these issues going on with the worthiness. And the thing about being worthiness is I, I want everybody to feel worthy of a wonderful life, but I also want people to understand that feeling worthy of things, number one, is a process that never ends. You're never done with imposter syndrome. You're never done with insecurity. You're never done with self-doubt. And even when you achieve your dreams, you are sometimes going to look at those things and be like, am I worthy of this? Surely there's somebody that's more qualified to have what I have or be in the position that I'm in. Those doubts never go away. And if you make creating things dependent on eliminating those doubts or graduating beyond them, you'll never get anything done. And more importantly, self-esteem isn't something that you can just talk yourself into. Self-esteem is something that you build over time by observing what you are capable of doing in the real world. As you do something and you experience what it's like to get better at it, you start to develop more confidence. As the saying goes, confidence comes from competence. And as you take the baby steps necessary to build competence, you'll find that confidence naturally flows from it and you won't experience that self-doubt as much. And so I just want people to give themselves permission to put ideas about worthiness on the shelf and instead ask them, why not me? You know, like, like wh why, why would I not deserve to try out the things that I'm interested in? I'm here just like everybody else. Why not? Yeah. I, I like that, that last approach. I think when you're approaching new things, it's important to approach them uh, selfishly 
You don't need to uh, go into something thinking that I'm here to impress X, Y, Z. I'm here to, um, you know, set the record straight or, you know, break any uh, worldwide, worldwide records worldwide. That was not worldwide. <laughs> I completely <laughs> messed up my highlight clip, but we're going to start over. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I think when approaching these kinds of things, you don't need to have that kind of pressure, right? You you can just go yeah. into something knowing that you're you're going about it to selfishly learn and to selfishly get better. You're not worried about breaking some records. You're not worried about impressing this customer or that customer. You're literally going about this process for maybe the first time, maybe even the second time. And you're going to get familiar with something like it's 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 an exploration into your passions. It's an exploit exploration into the things that you're interested in. And if you choose to do that publicly, which I think I encourage you to do, and I think TK would back me on this, if you choose to do that publicly, it's more of a concept of learning out loud, where not only are you demonstrating to people who are going to be watching and, and consuming whatever form of creativity you're coming up with, it's demonstrating to them that you can execute, that you can show up on time, that you can stick to your word, that, you know, that when you put your mind to something, you're going to go after it. So it, it dr demonstrates a track record of consistency and reliability, but it also, I think it, it's one of those situations where you just learn so much more by doing. And if you approach new activities and new endeavor, in, endeavors by a mindset of I'm doing this to learn, you don't have to necessarily worry about if you are this expert or you know you have these certifications to be able to participate in this activity. You're simply doing it for uh, the experience. You're simply doing it for learning. Um, so even if you're going to shoot an independent film, you're, you're not going, you don't necessarily need to go into it trying to win, uh, you know, an award. You can go into it saying, this is a project uh, that I'm really passionate about. Uh, this is something that whether this one succeeds or not, I would like to try this process again. So it, it it's just a matter of reps. Like, no, I don't have to be this nominated um you know, director, no, I don't have to, no, I don't need to mentor under some really successful uh, producer, but I'm just going to try my hand at this um, and I'm going to give it everything I got and I'm going to create the best that thing that I can create. Like just because you're learning at something doesn't mean that you're not going to give it your all. It doesn't mean that it, it it's not possible that it turns out good. It just means that you're going about it to learn. You're going about it um for self-improvement. You're not going about it because everybody else's expectations or what people are saying on the internet. Uh, you're going about it for your own uh, self-fulfillment and your own development. I think that's a really good point. Making that distinction between being an expert and being someone who is sharing their ideas because they're passionate about it or being someone that's a fan or being someone that's a student, allowing other people to observe their learning process. I think there's this sort of misconception that to turn a camera on or to share your ideas in public is to presuppose that you're some great and mighty wizard over whatever it is that you talk about. And if people don't feel like they have earned the status of great and mighty wizard, well, they don't give themselves permission to ever put themselves out there, to ever Could share I their two cents and on a matter and ask you, why do you think that's the case? Like, why do you think that, um, you know, we, we've, we have this notion that when we have a camera on us or, or when we put ourselves out publicly that we're supposed to be this high and mighty being? Well, I think a lot of it comes from the fact that the world used to be that way. We used to live in a centralized world where in order to even have a voice, you had to be someone that earned it by having several PhDs, publishing several books and so on. So look at the difference between Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia. You have this user-centered, more decentralized approach where everyone is updating the information and challenging each other versus this Encyclopedia article where 
there are two people that are chosen by the editors to be the experts that get to pontificate on this subject. Or in the old era, if you wanted to be a political commentator or a sports commentator, you had to apply. There were only about five places that allowed anyone to do this. And you had to be picked by them. And they only picked people that had certain credentials. We now live in a world where anyone, no matter what their background experience is, can turn on the camera, go on Zoom, give their opinion about last night's basketball game, publish it on YouTube, and have people watch and say, hey, I think I like the way this person talks about basketball, even though they have no right to be talking about it based on the old system's way of determining who was worthy to speak. And so a lot of this is kind of like a hangover. It's a residual effect from the world that we used to live in. And we have to give ourselves time to acclimate to a new set of rules, right? Um, I think that's a big reason why. And I think what's important for people to see is that there are more reasons for sharing your perspective other than feeling like you are the best thinker on a topic. There are more reasons for sharing your perspective other than feeling higher in yourself, like you're the best or you're in the top 1%. Sharing your perspective can simply be a way of connecting with others who share a common interest. Sharing your perspective can simply be a way of you practicing your communication skills. It can be a way of you improving your ability to learn because there's something about having to take an idea and do something with it, create something with it that helps you process the information differently. And so there are lots of reasons to share perspectives. And this new world is challenging us to think more creatively about that. So if you're someone that's interested in something, give yourself permission to go after it, give yourself permission to talk about it. And like Kamau said, you don't have to worry about being a non-expert as long as you don't represent yourself as something other than what you are. So if you wanna get online and you wanna talk about music, you can just be honest and say, hey, look, I've got no degrees in this. I have no 20 year career in this. I've never published my articles in some celebrated music magazine, but I am obsessed. I am a fan. Here is why I'm here. You're free to ignore me, but I hope you enjoy it. Check it out and let me know what you think. And you can learn that way. There's nothing hypocritical about that. And there's nothing about that that requires you to be worthy of anything. What's what's interesting about technology and social media and the way that things have evolved, a lot of big brands actually like to shoot commercials on iPhones or like to um, yeah. record these promotional videos on you know, on cameras that don't look all that official. And I think it's yeah. a trend because what the consumer wants these days is authentic. They, they want to feel like um, other people, other real people are actually saying these things, that they're not very scripted. They're not um, these manicured and curated messages that are coming out, that they're authentic, that they're true, that they're organic. And so I think individuals have an advantage in this regard because they don't necessarily uh, need to go into whatever their form of creativity is with this really high production um, budget or, you know, super top line equipment. People want to just hear what you got to say. I think a lot of people can relate to me better than they can relate to an expert, right? Um, somebody who's studied for 30 years in this given field. Um, yeah. The words that I might say might connect better with them because we might be in a similar place in life. You know, we might have had a yeah. lot of the same experiences. We might be from the, the same location or grew up in the same neighborhood. And I, I think people really value that. And that has only gone up over the years that, that people really do value like authenticity and or, organic content yeah. um, and just organic forms of creativity. You know, everybody has a soft spot for the mom and pop shops or the mom and pop ice cream parlors um, that are in the neighborhood because it feels tangible. It feels like, you know, I could put myself in your shoes and, and I could see where you're coming from. So if anything, I think that's something that should make you feel worthy. You know, as long as you're yeah. going into something with, a high level of authenticity, you know, and, and you admit that you're and you're not an expert and you don't have these 
you know, super uh, recognizable credentials, I, I think that does make you worthy. I think people would still want to hear from you. Um, and, and it's just done in a way that that is so organic and it, it and it feels really natural for you, which is going to take off that pressure. Um, and is and I think is going to allow people to connect with you better. Yeah, man, if I want to learn the piano, I think I'm going to be pretty intimidated by the world's top classical pianist. I think I'm going to find a lot more accessible, a friend of mine that's been playing for a couple of years who may not know everything, may not even know enough to be a teacher, but knows more than me. That's the person that I'm going to go to be like, hey, like, how do you do the, the fingering with the chords when you're trying to do that thing? That's the person that we go to. And that's actually how real life plays out. In fact, most of the experts that we go to, we go to because of someone who's not an expert that we like, that we trust, that we relate to, who tells us, oh yeah, check out that expert there. And they teach us a couple of things that they know and it's, it's helpful to us. But experts can be intimidating and sometimes experts need those intermediaries and anyone can play that role. The people that, um, that turn you on to experts, the people that make you open-minded to experts because they present the information in a way that's accessible because it's coming from someone that's not too far removed mm -hmm. from where you are. All right, let's go to number three for the last one. Don't poke and prod, react and respond. When people like Seth Godin go around saying nice sounding things like poke the box, remind yourself how successful he is. Then ask the following question. Who is this guy to think he can teach me? Do not, I repeat, do not try to answer that question. Also, do not question the assumptions you're making when you ask questions like these. If you're ever going to succeed at being creative, you'll have to master the art of asking really pointed questions and then running in the opposite direction of anyone who claims to have answers. A true lord of the uncreative realm understands the real purpose of questions. While the foolish masses are content to ask a question because they're looking for an answer, the wise ask questions because they're looking for an escape. So if you ever feel cornered by an insight that threatens to hold you accountable to something higher, questions are your best friend. Ask them and run away. But seriously, don't poke and prod. You might embarrass yourself. And if someone sees you, you'll probably get criticized. Nobody, nobody ever gets anywhere by adopting playful or experimental approaches to life. In all things, be a reactor. Don't stir the pot. Don't try to shake things up. Take all your cues from predictable external factors and leave your curiosities and ambitions out of the equation. There was a villain in Ant-Man who ignored this advice and he ended up dead. You get the picture. The way that you're reading these... <laughs> The way that you're reading these um, these passages, it, it reminds me of like the book Animal Farm and the Big Brother. Like that's you're you're the Big Brother of making your dreams come untrue. It, it's just hilarious. I feel like we need to do an audio book. Make your dreams come untrue. A sarcastic approach to a better life. Oh my gosh, yeah, man. Um, so this, this is an interesting one. Um, mm -hmm. Experimentation and play are such an important aspect of success. And I think people tend to understand it well when you put it in terms of things like dating or things like making friends. You got to flirt before you date and you got to date before you get engaged and you got to get engaged before you get married. And if you skip any one of those steps by trying to go straight to the other, you tend to run into problems. You don't want to pressure yourself to marry someone if you haven't even flirted with them, if you haven't even gone out on a date with them, if you haven't even had a conversation with them. So why do that to yourself when it comes to your interest? Should I, you're a freshman in college, should I major in, in biology? I'm not sure if I like it or not. Why would you make such a big decision? If you're not sure if you like something or not, scale it back a little bit. Give yourself the permission to experiment and be playful. Playful. What got you interested in this, in this in the first place? What is it that makes you think this is interesting? Watch, spend a weekend watching a few hours worth of YouTube videos on the subject. Do you get bored? Do you like it? Take a class on it. Did you enjoy it? Did you hate it? You've got to give yourself room to say, 
I'm going to try something out without making any promises to the outside world, without mm -hmm. making any commitments to myself that I'm going to do this for the rest of my life or that I'm going to do this for the long term. I'm just going to do what Seth Godin calls poke the box. I'm going to see what happens. In, in that book, Poke the Box, he said that, you know, he grew up, his father didn't have a lot of money and they didn't really have toys. And his father bought, uh, gave him and his brother a mechanical, a black mechanical box. And that was kind of like their toy. And they didn't know what it was. They didn't know what it did. And so they poked the box. And that's kind of like what children do, right? When they're trying to discover things, they poke the box, whether it's their fingers, whether it's a cup, they, they, they poke the box. They, they do something without knowing what's going to happen. And then they observe to see if anything happens. And then they do something else. And you've got to give yourself room to poke the box if you want to unlock and unleash your creativity. All of your decisions in life can't be from a vantage point of what should I commit to next? Ask yourself, what should I exper experiment with? What should I explore? What should I play with? That's how you discover interesting things. And those discoveries make your commitments much easier down the road because they give you self-knowledge. I really value poking and prodding. I think, yeah. I think as, as a society, uh, we were probably trained uh, to, to stop doing that at a really young age because kids naturally poke and prod. Like that, it's just a part of um, the natural childhood curiosity that you want to understand why you want to understand, but what about this? What if it worked like this? Have you guys thought about this? And teachers and, you know, parental figures and, um, you know, people who, who work with kids, a lot of times, I think it makes them feel uncomfortable. Like, why are you asking so many questions? Like, just, this is the way things are. Just, you know, learn this and then kind of fall in line. And I think some of the most powerful creators, some of the most, um, you know, innovative entrepreneurs are the people who got in touch with that childlike curiosity and gave that self, gave that inner self permission to ask those questions, to poke, to mm. prod, uh, to be that annoying little child that is trying uh, to grapple with this concept, but trying to think about it in all the ways that aren't being talked about. You got to be able to do that. You got to be able uh, to feel comfortable um, poking and prodding and not being scared about ruffling feathers. You know, just 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 go, just do, just ask. Um, and and that does start with giving yourself permission. Yeah, I think there's this kind of uh, fear that we have of wasting our time. You know. And, and so we feel the need to justify everything that we do in terms of, mm. I can explain to the people in my life, the people that push me to be responsible, that this will be a good use of my time. And when you're playing that game, you need to be able to accurately anticipate what's going to result from this activity and then show people that this will be a profitable use of time and money. And there is a context for that way of thinking, of course. But you need things in your life that you enjoy doing that you can't justify in that way because that's how you find out stuff that you don't already know that's how you discover interests that you don't already have i think about it in terms of sports let's take basketball when you're in a game you've got to do what you know and you've got to try to be as effective as possible the middle of a game is not the time for you to work on your three-pointer either you have a three-point shot or you don't and if you don't have a three point shot, then you do not want to spend a lot of time taking them in the game because the goal of the mm -hmm. game is to use the best of your abilities to try to win. However, when you're in practice, that's a different context. In practice, you don't lose a game for missing a shot. The goal of practice is to get better. And so if you have the potential to be a good three point shooter and that's a goal of yours, take some three point shots, take a hundred of them. You know, because that's the that's the space for you to discover something new and for you to develop skills that you don't already have. So don't treat every aspect of life as if it's game seven NBA finals. I need to stick with what I know and what got me here. Treat at least a portion of your life as this is practice. This is rehearsal. This is a space where I can afford to make mistakes 
because it's only by doing what I'm going to make mistakes doing that I can actually get better. Sure. I, I think what I would say, because as somebody who often views my life as a professional, a professional basketball player, and I view, yeah, you know, all these obstacles, in, all these obstacles in my life as, um, you know, various either games or uh, <laughs> all, all the challenges that come with being a professional basketball player. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that that analogy can sometimes be hard to translate, though, because as mm. as regular folks, there's not a whole lot of practice time built into our life. Um, you know, mm. th there's times where, you know, we need to show up at work. Um, we, you know, when we clock in, when we punch in, you know, technically this is the game. Like it might not be a huge project at work, but you know, you're playing for real. Like th this is, uh, real time game decisions can happen and, uh, you can lose your job. Uh, you can, um, you know, get demoted. Like th th there are things that are happening in real time. And so practice really isn't a part of yeah being an adult uh i i think a lot of times that's left uh when you were you when you were a kid when you were learning i think a lot of times once you get to adulthood you're almost expected to already know stuff like you don't mm -hmm. there's not like a lot of space in, in in people's mind that you don't know something like if you don't know something then you just don't know and you'll never know like you'll just be that kind of person but i think for people who are all about learning you you have to uh give yourself that time to practice you have to create space because society isn't going to do it for you your boss isn't going to do it for you um you know even your family members your significant other like people as adults just don't think of life in terms of practice and play uh it's just all happening in real time but it is so important to create that space for you uh, to get better and, and not even to get better at your craft necessarily, but to explore the things that you're interested in, like practice. The, 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 the purpose of it is to develop yourself. Yes, that can come, you know, in terms of basketball uh, from practicing on some of the skill sets that you already have, like your three point shot or your uh, free throws or, you know, whatever. But it's also a time to just, you know, get crazy, like try something new, you know, try something that you watch yeah. on YouTube and and just try something that makes you feel good. Like, oh, that that looks fancy. The, the yep. same mindset should apply uh, to people who are all about creative endeavors. Like you should create space to try something that makes you feel like funny. It's like, oh, snap, like that. That could be something if I uh, spend some time and, and give effort to it. So. I know as creators, we come across different things uh, that that do inspire us, that that make us think, that keep us up at night, and 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 ask us these you know scientific equations like, well, what if I put this here, and and how would this react, and yeah, you know yeah. what would be the result of that? That desire, that interest means something and that can translate into something cooler but you got to spend the time you got to create the space to practice on that to develop that thing right on i i think it's important to so in in the analogy i gave and there's a weakness there the analogy i gave i treated practice as something that's separate from the game and i treated the game as like that's where you got to get everything right and practices that's where you're free to make mistakes and real life is a lot more nuanced than that. And you have to seek out opportunities for practice within the context of the game itself. And there are always moments yes. in the game where you can afford to do something that's a little bit riskier because of the situation you've put yourself in. So yes. this is something that we do with this show. We, we have a goal and we show up to try to deliver on that but we also take creative risk within the context of things that we know we can get away with and explore. One example of that was we did the episode on heartbreak, betrayal, and cheating. We had never done a show about that topic. And the opening clip was a little spicy, right? It was about um, a guy who played a prank on someone that cheated on him. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't know 
how our audience would respond to it. Our audience might be, yeah, this was boring. I prefer kind of the more traditional inspiration stuff. But then a part of us was like, yeah, but this is an area where a lot of people get down. This is an area where a lot of people feel bad about life. And I think we can say something inspirational about this topic. But that was a risk, but it wasn't like a big risk. It wasn't like we were coming on here just acting like complete fools, being inconsistent with the value proposition that this show has. And so you have to look for moments like that, try new things, and be open to the idea that it didn't work. Okay, audience didn't like that. We don't think it was that great. Let's move on and do something else. Or, hey, that was actually surprisingly good. Let's do something that's kind of a variation of that. And so you always have those moments. There are things you do at work that are so high risk that you need to just focus on getting them right and doing them by the book. But there are always these little things where you're given some creative freedom and where making a mistake won't get you fired. Those are the areas where you want to try to explore new ways of doing things and then be open to the feedback that comes. Mm, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, hey, y'all, that's a wrap. We're going to end it right there. Those are three of the 10 rules for making all your dreams come untrue. If you want to check out the full article, go to fee.org and search TK Coleman, 10 rules for making all your dreams come untrue. If you enjoy this episode, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Let us know in the comments what your thoughts are and if there's anything in the future you'd like to hear us talk about. Be sure to subscribe to the Revolution of One YouTube channel if you're not already subscribed. And feel free to share this with a family member, friend, or anyone else, even an enemy that you think might benefit from this. All right, y'all. Have a great rest of the week. <laughs>